everyone. I'm Carol Hinkle, president of Triple E. I want to thank you all for joining on Zoom today. Hopefully you all did receive the email that we had to not be at the church this morning. We had to make that decision by 8.30 and we expected ice and a little snow on top of it. And that's what we got. That's really dangerous. And we're trying to keep everybody here safe. It just reminds me that I want to suggest that you all try to check your email every Friday morning by 11 a.m. Just in case we have some crazy thing. Maybe there's no heat at the church. Maybe the speaker's sick. Maybe we have ice, whatever. So make it a plan to check by 11 every Friday morning to make sure there's no changes or alterations. By the way, a couple people today said that our emails went into their junk mail or spam. So you want to be sure to check that th those places too. Um, I want to suggest that you learn how to, if you haven't already, ask questions. So Kathy Chamberlain is going to monitor the questions that you ask, and you can start now, anytime during the lecture. If you have an iPad, it would be at the top of your screen. If you have a computer, it would be at the bottom of your screen. But you want to touch those areas and see the Q&A button and up will pop a screen. You can type in your message and then either push the arrow or push return on your computer. And please, we want lots of questions. We'll open that session up at about quarter of three. Okay, so now I wanna introduce our speaker, Jared Carter. For those of you who've been members for a while, you've had, you've been, had the pleasure of hearing him before. We're, we're thrilled that he's starting off our spring session. It doesn't seem very springy. Anyway, Jared Carter graduated from Vermont Law School in 2009. In addition to serving as an articles editor on the Vermont Journal of Environmental Law, he received an Equal Justice Foundation Fellowship to litigate a constitutional challenge to US Treasury Department regulations prohibiting travel to Cuba. A veteran attorney and advocate for social, legal, and economic justice, Professor Carter spent a year as law clerk to Justices William Leppert Jim Rice, and Jim Nelson at the Montana Supreme Court. Professor Carter returned to Vermont in 2010 to teach and practice law and teaches natural resources law, political lawyering, legal writing to appellate, appellate advocacy, and climate change and law. In addition, he's developed study away courses that take students to Cuba to learn about the Cuban legal system. An active member of the Vermont Law, he also directs the Vermont Community Law Center, litigate constitutional and consumer rights issues in state and federal court. Professor Carter has a wealth of re relevant experience and is dedicated to bringing his diverse background to the classroom. He is an avid outdoors person, backpacking, canoeing, and fly fishing in the warmer months and cross country skiing in the winter. Despite the fact that Vermont is landlocked, he also enjoys surfing and does so in the frigid waters of the New England coastline. Please welcome Jared Carter. Great, uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, and, and thanks to Triple E for having me back. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, in fact, I think the last time I presented um, was in the the pre-pandemic world in 2019, uh, we talked about some important issues confronting the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and certainly a lot has, of course, changed since then. Uh, and the court is different uh, it, it, as well. Um, and so I'm really just thrilled to be back. And it would have been great to see everybody uh, in the church. Uh, but but um, I think probably the right call, I was chatting beforehand uh, with, with Carol and, and others. As I was driving in, I'm at the Vermont Law School Burlington office today, uh, which is nice. But as I was driving in, uh, I saw several people fall over uh, on the sidewalks. Uh, so I think it's pretty slick out there, or at least it was this morning. I, I truthfully haven't ventured out since. But I'm really happy to be back um, and, and to chat with you all about where we're at today with the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, democracy, the rule of law, and also what are some interesting and important cases that the U.S. Supreme Court is either confronting right now, like deciding soon, and, uh, and or 
that I think they're going to be confronting in short order. And there's there's a lot of really important ground to cover uh, in our in our hour. I do want to save a chunk of time at the end for question and answer. Uh, so please do uh, drop your questions in the chat. Uh, I'll look forward to trying to answer them as best as I can uh, when we get to that point. So the Supreme Court today, democracy today, the rule of law today, um, I don't know about all of you, uh, but the past few years have been a difficult few years. Uh, I think there's a level of anxiety in our society, uh, in our democracy, um, that certainly I, I've never seen before. And I think part of that is the pandemic. Part of that is the, the divisiveness of our politics. Um, and while Vermont perhaps isn't ground zero for this, it's certainly not immune. So I think I would start this conversation off by acknowledging that reality. And the U.S. Supreme Court uh, is, of course, uh, part of that and is going to be impacted by that. Um, so I think we're, we're perhaps right to be apprehensive. We're perhaps right to be nervous. Uh, about the status of democracy and the rule of law in 2023. Um, but for a whole host of reasons, while I'm certainly uh, concerned about some of these things and, and, and they're obviously important things, I personally have faith in our commitment, our broader commitment to the rule of law, uh, which the Supreme Court in my mind really represents. Uh, and if I think, and I think when I get nervous about these sorts of things, when I start to worry about, you know, where is our democracy going? Where's the rule of law going in the future? Uh, I think it's important to reflect on, you know, instances in our past where law, the power of the law, the rule of law have most shown themselves. And if you look at that history, it's often been two steps forward, one step back. But the rule of law has been a constant. Uh, and oftentimes, the places where the rule of law moved us forward the most were after times of, of, of great upheaval, great confusion, in some cases, violence. Um, right? So you think about uh, all the way back to the founding of the country and the, the revolution, uh, the United States Revolution, uh, which was, of course, of course was a, a, a violent event. Uh, you know, people dispossessed of land, battles fought, um, you know, tea thrown in the in the ocean, among other things. Uh, and out of all that chaos and and violence and 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 risk, what did we get? Well, two steps forward. We got the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution. We got our independence. Of course, with those two giant steps forward, uh, there were certainly steps back. Uh, those wonderful, those wonderful Bill of Rights rights that we enjoy uh, didn't apply uh, to really anyone outside of uh, wealthy men. Uh, and, and indeed, the Constitution that came out of that, that revolution uh, enshrined slavery in it explicitly. So the rule of law moved us forward, but also was responsible for pulling us back. But we made progress and there was always opportunity to make more. And I think the rule of law was a big part of that. You flash forward 80 more years to the Civil War, uh, right? Of course, great violence, people, millions of people uh, in slavery, uh, enslaved, the Fugitive Slave Act, battles uh, that in which many, many people were killed, uh, literally family against family, as we know. Uh, and yet out of that sort of crucible of, of, of violence and, and danger and division, right, we got the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, right, banning slavery, guaranteeing the right to vote, uh, and protecting uh, the right to equality, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, and yet, of course, even in that era, with those steps forward, that gave birth to things like Jim Crow. Uh, and, and still, even at that time, women couldn't vote. So two steps forward, one step back, but the rule of law was always there. The Supreme Court was always there. You flash forward another roughly 80 years, right? What do we have? The Great Depression, 
right? I mean, bread lines, people losing their property, losing their jobs, uh, Hoovervilles, right? Across the country, grapes of wrath, uh, really difficult times. But we got the new deal, right? The safe, the social safety net, social security, uh, employment, labor laws to protect uh, folks. Uh, and so we took a giant step forward. Some would say those changes uh, were uh, sort of the, the starting place for the incoming inequality that we see today. Um, but I guess the reason I sort of start with that quick historical narrative, and of course there's other major turning points in US history, is because to me, I find comfort in that, right? Even for those two steps forward, one step, steps back, um, even in those times of real chaos, real division, uh, real difficulty, uh, the court and the rule of law found a way forward. Um, and I think even in this time of, of, of great division, right? COVID, January 6th, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Dobbs decision, regardless of one's perspective, um, all of these things make us feel like things are out of control and, and the division does feel great and perhaps it, it is real. Uh, but I always find faith in that rule of law. Um, and the Supreme Court really embodies that to my mind, right? What is the rule of law? Everybody could, of course, come up with their own definition. Uh, but to me, it's something that's not really tangible. Uh, it's, it's, it's an idea, right, that what the court says, even if we disagree with it, is the law of the land. And we're willing to accept that regardless of whether we agree. Now, maybe we disagree with the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court, but we accept it as the law of the land. That's the idea of the rule of law. Maybe we organize to try to change it politically. Maybe we organize to try to elect a different president to put new members of the court uh, in over time. Uh, but we accept it as the law of the land. Uh, and I think a society that stops doing that is in real trouble. You have a real constitutional crisis. Because remember, unlike Congress, who has the power of the purse, right, they can stop funding things, or the executive branch, which can use, I suppose, theoretically, its military might, uh, its economic might to influence things. The U.S. Supreme Court has nothing. There's no army of the U.S. Supreme Court or police force to go out and enforce their decisions. They're enforceable only because our society believes them to be sacrosanct, even if we disagree with them. And there's plenty of U.S. Supreme Court decisions that I disagree with with all my being. But I still recognize that that's the law of the land. And I might organize, I might litigate to try to change those laws. But the rule of law is, I think, that acceptance that um, that, that we are a nation of laws, not of, of, of people, so to speak, uh, and that nobody is above the law. Uh, and that even if we disagree with the law, it is the law. Uh, and, 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 and to me, that's a fragile thing because it's not written in a constitution somewhere. It's not a document. Uh, and so it's scary. Um, and I fear for it in some ways because of where the US Supreme Court is today. Um, and I don't mean that in a political sense. I mean that in a credibility sense. Um, historically, the U.S. Supreme Court has been one of the more uh, popular branches of government of the three. It usually has the most support, the most trust of the American people. And in, in recent years, we've seen that really decline. And my concern is that if it declines to such a point where we no longer give it faith, Right? We, don't, we no longer accept its rulings as a society, then I think we're really treading into, into dangerous water. And some of these, uh, these this, la this loss of credibility, shall we say, in the court have been self-inflicted wounds. Um, the current Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, I think is an institutionalist, does care about the courts as an institution. Uh, but nonetheless, if you kind of walk through the past I don't know, decade, maybe a little less of the court, it's been a much more politicized body. Uh, and, and I think there's there's real risk in that. I mean, you go back to the, the um, Merrick Garland uh, situation um, in the Obama era. Um, and I think you can sort of trace it from there. It's almost been like 
a Democrat Republican tit for tat in the, the Supreme Court, uh, which doesn't really have any mechanism through which to defend itself has become a political hot potato. And I think, um, again, regardless of one's political views, that's a real risky game to play for both parties. Um, right. Think about, of course, the leaked Dobbs decision um, uh, that that, you know, we all read about, saw and, and quite frankly, the subsequent investigation that thus far they haven't been able to solve that uh, is really quite, quite troubling. Uh, right. People would like to think that the U.S. Supreme Court could keep its house in order. Uh, and I think our faith in it is based on that trust. Uh, and yet they can't figure out how it happened. Um, and, and so I think there is this sort of crisis of confidence right now in the court uh, that if we don't figure out may cause pain down the road. And, and, and that's a scary thought. And the only thing that sort of keeps me as somebody who studies and teaches this uh, from losing sleep at night, and I do lose a bit of sleep, and I probably have more gray hair since the last time I presented to you all in 2019. Uh, but the, the, what, what prevents me from, from losing too much sleep, I think, is that, that historical context that I started with, um, that ability of, of the country through the rule of law, even in difficult times, to move forward to make progress, even if it's faulting progress, a step forward, a step back, two steps forward, a step back. And I think that's in large part what gives me faith and, and, and why I think uh, that even in these difficult times, the Supreme Court can be a really important part of helping us step back from, from that brink. Um, but it's going to require us having faith, even if we disagree with the decisions of the court. And the court's going to be making some very important decisions, as it has recently in the coming weeks and months. Um, there's a there's a, an array of cases that are currently before the court that have been argued already that we're simply waiting to, for decisions on. And I'll touch on some of those in a moment. But just to highlight, there's a major environmental case, uh, Sackett v. EPA, that's been is before the court and will be decided in the coming months. There's important issues around affirmative action, voting rights, that's before the court that will be decided in the coming months. And I think there's some really important First Amendment issues. One is before the court now, and one I think will get there sooner rather than later um, that we should all be thinking about. And so I want to talk about a little bit about each of those in the context of this idea of rule of law, democracy, the Supreme Court today because they're going to impact us. And I think it's easy to, to be here in Vermont or quite frankly, anywhere in the country and say, well, the Supreme Court's, you know, it's far away, right? It doesn't really have an impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and, and for some of us, that may be true, but for the vast majority of us, it really does have a, have a major impact. Its rulings are the law of the land for, for good or bad. Um, and, it impacts us every single day. And yet it's, I think, a branch of government that we don't hear much about, we don't talk much about. Um, and perhaps that's by design, right? It's not meant to be a political branch. The, the, the framers tried to insulate it um, from politics, which quite frankly is, is one of the reasons I personally have been um, a, a bit horrified by the idea of adding justices to the court, uh, which I know has been something folks have talked about uh, because I think the downside risks of doing something like that, regardless of which party's in power at the time, uh, only serve to further politicize the, the court. And in some ways, I think there's, there's a short-sightedness to that approach um, because if we view the court purely through a political lens, uh, then does one half of the country just stop uh, a, 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 you know, accepting the court's rulings as the law of the land, uh, uh, depending on the issue. I don't think a, 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 a constitutional democracy can survive very long in that space. And so I, I, I take the view of the U.S. Supreme Court today, and I'll talk, talk about this like, more as we walk through some of these cases, but I take the view uh, that what we need to do is depoliticize the court, right? The framers set it up so that uh, 
uh, justices, war justices for life. Now, maybe there's some tinkering we can do around there, but I, I, I'm, I'm very hesitant to endorse any idea that would, would allow um, Congress to uh, remove justices outside of the impeachment process uh, or to reduce their pay or to regulate the way that they, be, they, 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 they um, engage um, for the very reason that, yeah, there might be good reason to try to uh, get Supreme Court justices to do certain things in the short term, but in the long term, it just becomes another political body. Um, and unlike the other political bodies, it really is the one that is responsible for the rule of law, that is responsible uh, for uh, its, it, the credibility of the laws that we have in this country and the democracy that those laws are based on. Um, so what are the big cases before the court right now? Uh, and I tried to pick a few that uh, might be of interest to pe the people, uh, you know, with a different background of interest. So I, I want to highlight an environmental case that I think we should be paying attention to. I want to highlight the, the, the affirmative action cases that we should certainly be paying attention to. And then I wanted to highlight some First Amendment uh, issues, including a case that's at the court now. Um, and a case that I think is percolating up in that direction. So the first case is a case that I, I mentioned earlier uh, called Sackett v. the EPA. And it is a case out of Idaho in which the, the, the plaintiffs, the Sackett side, um, had wanted to build a house on a lake in northern Idaho, right? In the, I guess the panhandle of Idaho. And, and that might seem like an un unlikely place for a U.S. Supreme Court case to, to, to start, right? Way out in the hinterlands of, of northern Idaho. Um, but they wanted to build this house a few hundred feet from uh, a body of water that was uh, essentially a lake that bordered both the U.S. and Canada. It, it crossed the border. So it was way up in northern Idaho. And as they began to move forward with their construction, the EPA... Uh, came and said, you can't do it. You're going to be impacting in a negative way uh, waters of the United States. And under the Clean Water Act, uh, which is a law that was, you know, passed some 50 odd, 60 years ago, it's not quite that long, but uh, it's been on the books for a while, uh, a law that really helped us clean up uh, the waters of this country. Uh, the EPA said, you can't, you can't do this the way that you want to do it. And they, of course, sued. Uh, they sued the EPA, uh, and the case moved up through the, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, basically on this question of what constitutes uh, a, a water of the United States. Because under the Clean Water Act, the, the EPA, the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, is allowed to regulate waters of the United States. Um, and not to get too wonky, but that authority actually comes back to the Constitution, uh, which granted Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. And, and obviously, at the time that the Constitution was drafted, a big way that commerce happened was via the waters of the United States. And so Congress passed the Clean Water Act, asserting that power over waters of the United States. And wetlands have consistently been considered a water of the United States. Uh, and, and, and yet in this particular case, the argument from the Sackett's perspective is that the wetlands that they're going to impact don't actually intersect enough with the waters of the United States, the navigable lakes and rivers uh, that the Clean Water Act has jurisdiction over. Uh, and the, 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 the upshot, if they're successful, is that the courts will then apply a very stringent test, which will limit the EPA's ability to um, enforce the Clean Water Act, because a whole category of wetlands, which are obviously very important for biodiversity, uh, climate change, and the like, a whole host of, of wetlands will no longer be within the authority of the EPA and fall under the Clean Water Act. Um, it'll, it will basically, it would basically, if the sackets are successful, it would basically require um, the EPA to show that in order to manage any of these waters, 
um, they actually have to flow into a navigable river or waterway, a channel used for interstate commerce which in some level you might might say, well, that makes sense, right? The law says you know, the Clean Water Act allows the EPA to, to, to manage the waters of the United States, you know, is the mud puddle in my backyard a water of the United States, right? And the answer, of course, is no. But the, but the problem is, as you, as, you, as you expand that out to wetlands, right? Um, clearly, even if on the surface, they're not connected with uh, a navigable river, the groundwater cycle uh, means that in the end, pretty much every significant wetland is going to be connected to a navigable water of the United States um, and, and would impact a navigable water of the United States. So changing, it sounds a little bit wonky, but truthfully, changing the way that the Clean Water Act is interpreted in the way that the Sacketts are asking the court to do would, and some people might think this is a good idea, and that's perfectly fair, um, Others certainly don't think it's a good idea, which is also a perfectly fair position to take. Um, it, the, the, the upshot, though, would mean uh, that the EPA would have significantly less power to enforce the Clean Water Act when it comes to wetlands in the United States. Um, and so uh, I think this is a, a hugely important case uh, and one that maybe isn't getting as much attention as it should, but will have, have a major impact. Uh, the second case I wanted to highlight um, is uh, um, a case, actually there's two cases before the court and they, they essentially consolidated them, uh, but they're affirmative action cases. Um, one uh, brought against the University of North Carolina, the other brought against Harvard. But the basic premise of these cases is that affirmative action results in discrimination uh, in this case, against uh, Asian Americans and Caucasian Americans. Um, that's the argument that the, the plaintiffs are making, that affirmative action uh, is, is in fact in violation, they argue, of the 14th Amendment, uh, which, as I mentioned before, was a post-Civil War amendment uh, uh, meant to ensure that uh, formal, formerly enslaved people were uh, granted equal rights under the law. Uh, uh, and, and, and so the, the argument now is, well, these affirmative action laws, or excuse me, affirmative action regulations at these two schools, but many schools have them, are, are unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment, equal protection, and illegal under the Civil Rights Act. Um, and the, the sort of interesting piece about this is that the, these um, affirmative action law policies have been challenged numerous times and have always been upheld in one form of the other. Uh, there was a challenge in the 1970s. Uh, in 2003, uh, one of the better known affirmative action related cases, uh, Grutter v. Bollinger, uh, involved in the University of Michigan Law School's affirmative action policies uh, were largely upheld and in 2016 as well. Um, so I think people that watch the court are concerned uh, that this time might be different. It's a very different court, um, but they're really looking at can schools have race conscious admissions policies of any sort? Um, you know, what are the parameters of that? Uh, can, do, do schools, uh, can schools use race as a factor among many, which is essentially the current law of the land um, to encourage, you know, diversity in a class. Um, if these, if these um, policies uh, are struck down, if these state laws are struck down, uh, schools will no longer be able to do that. Uh, and I think for many, there's, there's great concerns over the impact that will have on uh, historically disadvantaged members of our society. Um, but that's the case, right? That's the that's the matter that's before the court. So I think that one's obviously a very important one for us to watch. Hasn't been decided yet, but I think we'll see it shortly. And then the third category of cases um, that I wanna touch on are First Amendment cases, which that's the area of law that I spend the most time with uh, generally. Um, and so maybe I'm a little bit biased, but there is an incredibly important First Amendment case before the court right now 
uh, called uh, Alenis versus the state of Colorado. Um, and that case deals with Colorado's, what's called their Public Accommodations Act, which uh, sounds legal like legalese, but it basically, uh, every state in the country has a public accommodations law, and the public accommodations law says that if you are a public accommodation, uh, right, you're offering services to the public, um, that you can't do certain things. Among them, discriminate. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, it was many in many states, it was the public accommodations laws that desegregated hotels and restaurants um, south of the Mason-Dixon line, where there were obviously uh, segregated public accommodations. Um, and it was these public accommodations laws that came in and stopped that. Many states uh, have added to those public accommodations laws to include a prohibition against discrimination, discriminating against people based on uh, gender and sexual orientation, Colorado being one of them. So Colorado is a broad public accommodations law that says if you are a public accommodation, you can't discriminate uh, in who you serve based on race, gender, ethnicity, uh, sexual orientation. And there is a, a, a company owned by this person named Melenis out in Colorado who uh, makes wedding websites. And she decided she didn't want to, based on her religion, uh, she, she asserted that she didn't want to uh, make wedding websites for same-sex couples. And the state of Colorado uh, didn't ultimately enforce the law against her, but essentially threatened to enforce the public accommodations law against her. She brought what's called a preemptive challenge to the law under the First Amendment, um, claiming that if she was forced to produce wedding websites for same-sex couples, it would essentially be compelled speech, that the state would be compelling her to say something she doesn't want to say. Um, uh, and the, the way the law works in Colorado and in many states, there's sort of two pieces. Uh, there's a, what we call an accommodations clause in the law, which says that public accommodations have to accommodate people, in other words, serve them regardless of their you know, race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation. And then there's a communications clause in the law, and many states do this as well as Colorado, that says that you're not allowed to uh, make someone who, based on race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, feel unwelcome. Uh, and in addition to not creating these websites, this um, this person, Alenis, uh, wants to post on her business website that she, you know, doesn't do this for religious reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So um, she filed suit in federal court out in Colorado and it lost there lost uh, in the Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and now it's at the U.S. Supreme Court on the issue of whether or not the law violates her First Amendment right. Um, and it will be, of course, interesting and impactful to see what the court does here. Um, uh, because so many states, all states have these public accommodations laws. So if the court were to carve out some sort of exception uh, uh, in Colorado, that would have impacts on public accommodations laws across the country, uh, perhaps Vermont included. Um, and, and so I think, again, depending on one's perspective, uh, there certainly are real concerns about the court going in that direction uh, on the ground that it, it's a slippery slope, right? If you start letting people discriminate uh, based on, well, my religion says this, under the First Amendment or under the compelled speech doctrine, where does that stop, right? Um, uh, and 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 I think that's a valid concern uh, that that supporters of this law have. Uh, so I think that's a really important case to be on the lookout for. That case has been argued, and uh, I think we expect a decision in short order. I think if I was to guess what the Supreme Court's going to do here. I have a hard time believing that the Supreme Court's going to put its stamp on of approval uh, on uh, a, a, a First Amendment doctrine that essentially allows people to discriminate um, based on 
um, sexual orientation. I don't think the Supreme Court's going to say that's okay because of that slippery slope. Um, does does how, how could the court do that without sort of going back to the days of 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 of, of discrimination based on race uh, uh, and segregation in in public accommodations, hotels, lunch counters, all of those things that the civil rights uh, movement fought to end and 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 did under the law. Um, I don't think the court's going to going to open that door back up, but I think there's a chance that they will say the communications clause piece of the Colorado law is unconstitutional because it is banning this particular person's ability to uh, speak with respect to what her views are on this topic, which I think, of course, the First Amendment does protect, right? Whether we agree with it or disagree with it, uh, one is able to pronounce their views on, um, on topics uh, impacting our society. Um, so I think there's a chance they'll say that part of the law that prohibits that is unconstitutional, but I think it's pretty unlikely, or I would personally hope it's unlikely that the Supreme Court says, and not only that, but they they can also discriminate, right? This person no longer has to serve people based on their, their sexual orientation. But it's obviously a, 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 a matter of, of great import to many people, and I'm sure there's people out there that have varying views on the topic, but it's an important First Amendment case that will set an important First Amendment precedent that will impact the entire country. The other First Amendment issue that I that is not yet before the court, uh, but I think is headed in that direction, is the case that perhaps many of you have heard about. Um, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's a very important First Amendment case. Uh, and it's the litigation that's ongoing between Dominion uh, voting machines, the company that makes the voting machines, uh, and Fox News. Um, uh, and the argument that's being made by Dominion, and this stems back to the, the 2020 elections, of course, and the, the controversy surrounding that, um, uh, the, 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 the Dominion voting machine company sued Fox News on the ground that Fox News had defamed them um, by saying that their Dominion voting machines were, uh, you know, um, uh, providing fraudulent vote counts. Or I, I think there were, there's allegations that um, they were actually controlled by Venezuela or something like that. Dominion sued Fox News for defamation. They had been defamed. Uh, why is this an, why is this a First Amendment issue? You might say. Well. Uh, the, the, the test for defamation is fourfold. You have to have a false statement, right? Of fact, it can't be an opinion, right? So you can't be sued for defamation for speaking your opinion, right? And that's a first amendment overlay. It's because of the first amendment. So you have to have a false statement of fact, has to be publication to a third party, uh, and you have to have fault. Right. The, 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 the person defaming another has to have some level of culpability. So for like run of the mill defamation, that culpability is essentially negligence. Right. Uh, that you should have known uh, that this was a false statement that you're making, but you made it anyway. Right. Um, right. You don't have to have, you know, intent or knowledge. But for First Amendment purposes, what the courts have done is said when it comes to matters of public concern, it's harder to bring a defamation claim. When it comes to matters of public concern, when it comes to public officials or um, uh, uh, public figures, the court requires that somebody uh, bringing a defamation claim proves actual malice, right? In other words, that the speaker acted with knowledge of the falsity and did it anyway. Right. And the logic behind that, why the First Amendment comes into play there is because, of course, when it comes to matters of public concern, public officials, public figures, we want people to be able to speak freely. Right. And, and say, you know, I'm against this politician. This politician's a horrible, you know, lying, cheating, you know, thief. Right. <laughs> uh, right. We want people to not be scared to critique politicians and public figures. So we say that for a politician to turn around and sue me for saying that, 
they have to show that I knew what I was saying was false and that I did it anyway. Then that's the actual malice standard. And it comes from a, a case, a famous case called New York Times v. Sullivan. Um, and it, it dealt with publication that the New York Times had made. So the reason this is an important case uh, is, and I think will ultimately end up at the US Supreme Court, is because it gets at that question of how high is the burden to show actual malice? And there's members of the court right now who I think are interested in revisiting the New York Times v. Sullivan standard, which is really a standard that protects freedom of the press um, um, and insulates the press from being sued, essentially, for making a mistake in a story uh, or um, you know, from criticizing a politician uh, or a policy. Um, and so I think it, it's going to have uh, significant impacts, perhaps, on that doctrine. Um, and, and I don't know if folks saw this, but a couple of days ago, there was a filing, a couple of filings in the, in the, in the matter that got unsealed. Um, and it looks like Dominion's basic argument is that uh, Fox News commentators knew um, that the Dominion stories were false, that these that Dominion was not really controlled by Venezuela and that uh, the, the, the voting machines weren't making, you know, intentional mistakes for Joe Biden, uh, so to speak, and yet still covered that story, represented that story, spoke about that story, made commentary on that story. Fox News, on the other hand, argues that, you know, there's this freedom of the press principle at stake. Um, and that they should be free under the First Amendment to cover the controversy um, and cover the fact that the president and some of his lawyers were um, talking about, you know, the, the the election being stolen. And that that's, you know, public, that's a public issue, certainly public figures, uh, public officials, and that they should be able to cover that. Um, so it really gets sort of the, to the crux of this question, how far does the First Amendment go uh, when it comes to um, something that seems maybe as mundane as, as defamation, but will have real impacts, I think, no matter which way the court comes out on this, on freedom of the press, uh, on the ability of uh, the media to cover stories uh, for, for, for better or worse. Uh, so I think that's another important case that I'm following. It's not at the Supreme Court yet, but I think given the makeup of the Supreme Court, there's at least a possibility that we'll see the court revisit that New York Times v. Sullivan actual malice standard and perhaps lessen it in some way um, so that defamation claims could be brought uh, by uh, those who feel they've been defamed by a story in the media. Uh, so I think that's another really important case to watch as it sort of percolates up. I have no doubt that at some point, it might not be this case, but some case will make its way to the Supreme Court on this on this question in the coming you know, year, couple of years, uh, because I think there's an appetite to, to revisit it. So I think that's another really, really important case to watch out for down the line. But uh, I know maybe I've made everybody, you know, scared about the future of the court, the future of the law. Um, there'll be decisions in these three areas that I just highlighted that I'll disagree with, that probably many of you will disagree with. Um, uh, but I think it is important to remember uh, that principle about the rule of law, uh, to take faith in that, uh, to trust in that. Uh, and if we disagree with the court's decision, to my mind, the solution isn't to sort of blow up the court. Uh, of course, I mean that figuratively, but, but it, is, it is to instead organize, um, remember that elections matter, get out, vote, vote. Um, organize at the, at the state, local, and even federal level to try to make the change that you want to see in the world. And I got to say, I was heartened, um, not to bring this all the way back to Burlington, but I want to sort of wrap up, we'll get, get to questions. I was heart, heartened this morning. Uh, my, my son goes to uh, school in the new North End, um, and apparently there's talk of eliminating a, a, a component in the school, the STEAM program. Um, and maybe people think that's a good idea. Maybe people think it's a bad idea, but he decided he's in fourth grade 
that he was going to make a petition and try to get everybody in the school to sign it because he really loves steam. Um, and and it, it, it made me reflect on that, the importance of that engagement um, and, and gave me faith that the next generation of folks coming down the line are going to be doing that and are engaged and haven't sort of given up and said, everything's so divisive, the rule of law doesn't matter anymore, um, that they really are trying to be out there you know, making change, even if it's in their little communities. But but change only matters if we all agree with the, the, the sort of lay of the land, the laws of the land, and the rule of law and the Supreme Court are such a big part of that. Uh, and, and I think history thus far has sort of borne out the idea that even in those difficult times, the sort of moments of darkness, uh, the rule of law has survived and in fact moved us forward, even if haltingly, even if two steps forward, one step back. So I have no doubt that that will continue, even if maybe I'm not happy with the way some of these decisions come out. Um, I think we'll be okay uh, in the long run, as long as we all accept that basic principle. So it's 2.45 and, and I've, I've talked probably too much. Uh, I'm happy to turn it over to to, to questions, I, th I think I see there's some in the, the question and answer box, but uh, I guess, guess Kathy, you were going to read those to me, yeah? Yeah, we have nine questions, so I'm not, not sure you're going to get to all of them. So the first question is uh, uh, basically about a, requiring a separate branch of government, in this case, the Supreme Court, can they adopt ethics guidelines that will include conflict of interest rules? Yeah, so <laughs> that, absolutely, they could do that. Uh, and quite frankly, they probably should. Uh, here's the rub, though, as to why I think it's it's unlikely that those are going to be, I mean, they're just not going to be enforceable in any real meaningful sense. Um, uh, and that's, th that's because every justice that's on that court that has got, been nominated and, uh, and affirmed, uh, appointed and, and, and confirmed by the, the Senate, appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, has lifetime service. Uh, in other words, unless they are impeached, they can't be removed. So, so let's say, that, how does that impact an ethics policy that the court might adopt? Let's say that the court decides to adopt an ethics policy that says, you know, um, the spouses of Supreme Court justices can't be involved in, you know, political fundraising or something like that. There would be no way for the court to enforce that against any of the justices because they could not legally punish them. Um, th there would be no mechanism. You couldn't fire them. You couldn't demote them. You couldn't reduce their pay. Uh, so in some ways, uh, the, 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 they could pass ethics rules within the, within the, within the court. You could, you could do it themselves. Congress could try to pass ethics rules, but I just don't see how they would be enforceable. Um, and I, I get it, right? So one might say, well, maybe we need to change the way that the Constitution is written. Maybe, maybe we should have a constitutional amendment that would 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 provide for that. And there's that's a perfectly valid response. The problem, in my mind, with messing around too too much with the way that the court's set up is that it's it's going to open up a Pandora's box of politics on the court. Uh, that we might not be able to shut. Uh, and, and the problem with that in the long run, right, maybe we solve some problems in the short term, but in the long run, at least in my mind, a politicized court is an ineffective court. It's a court that we, 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 we listen to if we agree and we ignore if we don't. Uh, and I think that's a dangerous, dangerous precedent. So um, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of ethics rules that the court could create and adopt but in the end, at least for the justices, as I see it, they're going to be entirely voluntary. And I don't know that it would really necessarily move the ball all that much. And, and, and I know we're short on time, but I, there's one other point I would make. I think this is part of the reason that the investigation into the Dobbs leak failed. Um, and I think there's some things that I've seen come out uh, in terms of how vigorously the justices themselves were questioned. I think part of the reason for that is because uh, there's almost no ability to force a justice to participate in that investigation if they don't want to, um, because they can't be removed, uh, they can't be punished, uh, even by the chief justice. So what's their incentive to participate in an investigation, uh, particularly if they had some level of culpability in the leak? Uh, 
Uh, they just say, I don't want to talk. And mm -hmm. there's no way to force them to do that as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's part of the reason the investigation failed is because I think there's very, it's very, it's very possible that some of the justices just didn't engage. Here's a personal question. How did you first get interested in Cuba and, and does their just judicial system fundamentally differ from ours? Well, Cuba is really a fascinating place. Uh, and we take a group of Vermont law school students down there every year. It's so obviously so different. It's politics are entirely different. Uh, it's, it's system of, of economics is entirely totally different. And quite frankly, their constitutional uh, space is entirely different. Uh, there is no First Amendment protection in Cuba uh, in terms of the ability to speak and criticize in the way that we think about it here. Um, they have other rights. And what's so interesting to me about going down there is the conversations we have. Um, uh, you know, we certainly are and should be proud of our First Amendment rights. Uh, and, and those are things that are very different down there. They, they, in my view, are and should be proud of their right to health care. Uh, for example. Um, and so we have these really fascinating conversations that, that are friendly but vigorous debates about these topics. Uh, and I find the students get a lot out of that. Um, and, and I'm a big believer in this, in the idea of the way we move forward as we go and we learn from different places that do things differently. I couldn't survive in Cuba as a First Amendment lawyer. Uh, I, I believe too firmly in that, but there's other things I could learn based on the way that they do things. And I think traveling and, and coming to places like that with a certain level of humility provides for a great learning opportunity. So that's how I got involved. And that's why I still find it interesting to do. Two people have asked, do you think that the Supreme Court justice that should have term limits? Uh, term limits, I think makes, makes some sense. I don't know that I would do it in terms of a term, um, but that might be the most politically palatable. Um, uh, but that would certainly avoid um, some of the po politics, I suppose, uh, of, of this and would allow the court to be perhaps more reflective of, of the society. But I, 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 I'm, I'm, I got to admit, I'm hesitant to go down the path of amending the way that the Constitution sets up the Supreme Court, even if there might be some validity to those changes, I, I think there's also downside risks to, to further politicizing the court um, because it has no way to enforce its decrees other than our good faith acceptance of them, whether we agree with them or not. Hmm. But that's certainly a valid possibility, yeah. Is there no other way for Congress to grant the EPA jurisdiction over water quality in isolated U.S. otters other than the Commerce Clause? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, the short answer is, is no, uh, right? Co Congress, our, our Constitution sets up one of what we call limited powers. And so unless it's uh, given to Congress explicitly, they're not supposed to have it. Um, uh, now, obviously, Congress has very wide ranging powers, and probably the founders would find that to be very different than what they had envisioned today. But the basis of those powers in many instances is the Commerce Clause. Um, and so that's why uh, there's this question of, well, how connected does it have to be? And there's been high watermarks of the U.S. Supreme Court and low watermarks of the Commerce Clause over the years. Um, but, but certainly uh, Congress could amend the Clean Water Act, it would seem, um, and I think a, a cogent argument could be made that Congress's power does, in fact, extend to uh, to all wetlands because water, no, no water is in complete isolation from the navigable waters of the United States. Right. Groundwater is connected. Uh, the water cycle is connected. So it's somewhat of a it's like a it's a it's a scientific and legal fiction to say that these wetlands are not connected to that lake, uh, even though it's, you know, 300 feet away. Um, uh, so I, I do think Congress could amend the law to, to address that if the court were to, to go in a direction Congress didn't want it to. Good question, though. Um, in the past three or four years, there appears to be an effort among the justices to invite cases that the conservative majority want to hear and perhaps rule upon. Have there been previous periods in our history when there were similar subtle invitations? Um, I mean, I think yes. Uh, I mean, I, and I keep coming back to like, this is why elections matter. It's this is why, you know, 
it's always frustrating that whatever 56% of the population votes. Um, and, and, and that's, of course, maybe an easy way out, but, but I think it's true. Um, here's how the, the, the we, we don't know exactly why the court takes cases that it takes. Um, that's because it is a non, it's not a transparent uh, government body. Again, the theory being that in order for the court not to be swayed by the politics of the day, it's got to be able to debate and discuss, uh, you know, free from the prying eyes of the public. Now, maybe there's ways to do it better than it is, but I think that's not necessarily a bad uh, instinct. But the result is we don't know how and why the court takes cases that it takes. Here's what we do know. Uh, in order to get a case before the court uh, on, 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 you know, merits case, there has to be at least four justices that want to hear it. So if the court has moved in a more, quote unquote, conservative direction in recent years, which I think it has, uh, there's going to be more of those justices on the court and they're going to therefore be more likely to grant cert to cases. They're going to have the ability to grant cert to cases that maybe couldn't have been. So I think the court has moved over the years, of course, based on who's on, on the court. I mean, it, it's it's just as much a legal fiction in my mind to say that the court is insulated from politics. That's impossible, right? I mean, th there's no th there's no system that we could come up with to entirely eliminate that. And of course, members of the court come to the court with their own worldviews. Um, and, and there's no way to eliminate that either, I guess, unless we turn it over to artificial intelligence and or something like that, um, which of course would have its own risks. Uh, so I think, yes, the court does seem to be taking on these cases that, um, you know, perhaps allow it to make decisions that we could, we could, you know, broadly frame as going in a conservative direction. I don't think that's new to the court. Expanding the court to 19 would make it more representative, but no president would select enough members to change its nature. What is the downsize? Um, expanding it to 19? That's what it says. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I don't, I, I, I mean, I think you would need, if you were going to put a limit uh, on how many members of the court there could be, you'd need a constitutional amendment. So, I, I mean, I think the, 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 I mean, scholars debate this, but uh, on balance, I think most, most folks agree that have studied this, that the court could be expanded uh, even without a constitutional amendment. There was nothing, there would be nothing to prevent uh, a president from nominating 30 justices um, on, on paper anyway. Again, I think the problem with, with that is, do we then, I, I just don't see how we don't end up in a situation where as each party gets the, 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 the executive or the Senate, uh, we're basically just shifting the, the court to, to meet our political uh, uh, agenda. Um, and in the short term, that might allow, you know, my side or your side or whoever's side to get a, a win or two. Um, but in the long term, I think that's just not a tenable system. Um, and so, you know, it's not something I, I personally am in favor of. Hmm. Should there be a requirement that the Senate conduct up, down, voted on judicial nominations? Uh, could, the, could the Senate do an up, down vote? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't see why they couldn't. Uh, but you 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 have to meet the constitutional per parameters of of um, of the process. And look, the Senate has its its uh, its filibuster rules now, and I think the precedent's been set. You know, they they've removed and removed and removed the 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 sort of checks on that over the years. So I think that's resulted in a much more politicized process um, for for Supreme Court justices to, to, to get on the bench. And I think that's why we saw what we saw with Merrick Garland uh, and, and, you know, to a certain extent, some of the others as well that have been recently nominated. Um, you know, it's certainly the Senate's prerogative to carry its, out its constitutional duties, you know, as long as it conforms to them as it sees fit. But the more politicized the court gets overtly, uh, I think the, 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 the greater the risk to the rule of law. Hmm. After Dobbs, how important is precedence? Mm, a lot of people are wondering that, uh, you know, right, rightfully so. Um, I think it's got, for our system to function, precedent has to be critical to the court's decisions. Uh, we have a common law system of government. 
which is based on the idea that the law can progress slowly over time, but it has to happen incrementally. And only in those most extreme situations should the court reverse itself. If the court's constantly reversing itself, itself, there is no rule of law, right? We don't know what the law is from day to day. And so I think there are real risks to that. And I, I do certainly hope, regardless of the issue, uh, that the court returns to that um, that view in a more vigorous way, shall we say. And, and that might mean that sometimes the court's going to uphold cases that I disagree with. But again, it's that sort of law of the law, of, rule of the road, um, you know, the law of the land. Uh, it's, it's, I think, an important principle. This has been great. Thank you so, so much, Jared. What a great first lecture for mm -hmm. our spring session. So see you all next week, hopefully at the church or on Zoom. Have a good week, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Jared. Bye-bye.